Ambassador, it is a pleasure to be with you uh, once again. I want to thank you for uh, taking time from what I know is an extraordinarily busy schedule to uh, uh, address the group today. Uh, Ambassador Herzog has an illustrious career, and you all can read about his uh, extraordinary biography, but I'd like to dwell on some of it briefly to highlight the perspective that we're so fortunate today to enjoy. Ambassador Herzog has a long and um, impressive career within Israel's military uh, as an infantry officer, uh, many years as one of the premier intelligence officers uh, in the Middle East um, uh, with the uh, Israeli Defense Forces, and then with uh, leading Israeli Defense Forces strategic planning department. Uh, the ambassador went on and then became a, uh, a, a pivotal player in multiple peace process initiatives. Indeed, the number of conferences he attended are, uh, sort of lay out a geography of diplomacy. Annapolis, Taba, Y, uh, the Secretary Kerry's uh, efforts in 2013 and 2014. And um, last, but certainly not least, before his uh, appointment last year by uh, Prime Minister Bennett, he spent uh, several, um, uh, he spent a couple of years in Washington working for the Washington Institute for Near Eastern Policy and with other organizations, becoming a, a powerful voice in academia and think tank. So you have, we have a, an incredible perspective today, and we want to thank you for bringing that. Our time is limited, and with your permission, I would like to dive into the uh, first uh, question. Ambassador, um, your country's view on the Iran nuclear deal is well known. We've heard this earlier today. Uh, the deal has uh, uh, many issues and is unlikely to be achieved in the near term. Let's put on your intelligence hat, your diplomat hat for a moment and say, if the deal does not, um, uh, is not resuscitated, what is the course the international community should take and do you believe it is capable of taking this course to both contain Iran's aggressive behavior in the region as well as to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon? Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction. And I'm very happy to be here and speak at this conference. And I highly appreciate what Yuan is doing. And I'm delighted to be interviewed by Norman. I've known him for years. and. Uh, we both have intelligence background. I always say, once intelligence, always intelligence. Now to your question. <clears throat> Let me first say that uh, Israel is not against a diplomatic outcome uh, to the Iranian uh, nuclear situation. Uh, we agree with the US administration that Iran should be denied uh, nuclear military capabilities. We agree that the best course of action is through diplomacy, but the question is, what kind of a diplomatic outcome are we talking about? And both the JCPOA and the deal that's now on the table, which has been delayed, but it's still there, uh, both of them maintain the nuclear infrastructure in Iran. It doesn't dismantle it. We know that the Iranian ambitions to become a nuclear armed state are still there. The deal doesn't cover the delivery systems, missiles and so on. And all uh, the deal does is just kick the can down the road, but with time, with the uh, set of uh, sunsets which are built into the, this deal, almost all limitations on the Iranian nuclear program will expire, and with time, Iran will be legitimized as a nuclear threshold state, which is unbearable for the state of Israel. Israel cannot bear such a situation. Our thinking is that while diplomacy offers a set of uh, incentives to Iran, legitimacy, a lot of money, and the ability to maintain that infrastructure for the future, mu they must be faced with <coughs> very strong disincentives, which include economic pressure, political pressure, refer to the Security Council uh, if need be, possible snapback of sanctions, plus a credible military option as a last resort. They have to face all of that because they will not give anything voluntarily. And I think that's critical with or without a deal. The most critical element in my view, in our view, is to enhance deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Iran, whether there is a deal or there's no deal. Because lacking, uh, lacking deterrence, Iran will cross one threshold 
after another, they will push the envelope and bring us to the, uh, the very dangerous situation where ultimately, certainly Israel, may, maybe others, will have to face the question of whether or not to take additional actions, uh, additional to, of course, uh, diplomacy and sanctions. Ambassador, I think one of your uh, one of the themes in your in your comments uh, that I'd like to underscore is the fact that those who oppose the resuscitation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action are not seeking military action in the region. They're seeking an arrangement which prevents the requirement for military action in the region. And I think we can all agree that uh, avoiding that is should be our primary uh, goal. I'd like to widen the aperture a little bit and talk about the region as a whole. Your country, you yourself, sir, have played a tremendous uh, part in the uh, Abraham Accords, in um, uh, opening up the region to a new topography of diplomatic, economic, cultural, technological engagement. Uh, as we, before we move to talk about Iran in the region, could you give us a sense of where you think the Abraham Accords have gone and where they're going and um, uh, what the biggest achievements have been uh, to date? So we just marked the second anniversary of the Abraham Accords a few days ago on September 15th. And in the two years that elapsed, I think uh, what happened on the ground is really breathtaking. Uh, I don't think uh, many people imagined that we would go so far in so short a time, in two years. If you look at the UAE, for example, our trade uh, exceeded one and a half billion dollars, and that's in two years. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis went to the Gulf, notwithstanding COVID. We signed the free trade agreement with the Emiratis. We have some defense agreements with some of our uh, new partners. And this is a different model than the one we've had uh, with Egypt and Jordan. This is not a cold peace between governments, it's a warm peace between peoples. And that's a very, very significant change. It kind of broke a certain glass ceiling, and I think uh, this is of historic magnitude. It opens a lot of avenues, and the way we think about it is to use uh, these new partnership to try and build uh, several regional architectures. One is a civilian architecture for the well-being of the citizens of the region. We are talking and actually we're implementing cross-border cooperation on numerous issues, climate change, economic issues, fighting the pandemic, uh, food and water security, and many others. We have not only bilateral agreements, but a several multilateral uh, frameworks. We have two trilateral working groups with the UAE and the Emiratis. We have one quadrilateral framework with including India, the Emiratis, the US and Israel. And we have six working groups established in what was originally the Negev Summit. Now it's called the Negev Forum. It's a forum. One on security and five on civilian issues. This is very, very significant. The other architecture we're trying to build is a security architecture. Since we are now in the area of responsibility of CENTCOM, this opened a lot of opportunities for us. And under the umbrella of CENTCOM, we are moving to develop regional cooperation, which I think is a very powerful response to Iran and Iranian activities in the region. And let me remind everybody, even if there is Iran nuclear deal, it does not cover Iranian activities in the region. Terror, subversion, missiles, drones, proliferation, all of this is not covered by any nuclear deal. So we have to take care of that, and we're doing it. And I would just, most of what we're doing under the umbrella of CENTCOM is below the radar, and it better stay there. But I would mention one important area of cooperation, which already got some media notice, and that is what's called the Middle East Air Defense Architecture. We are moving in that direction, and I think it will be a powerful response to Iran. That's a great response. And earlier today, we heard from uh, Ambassador Abdullah Al Khalifa from Bahrain, who is uh, an extraordinary individual. Uh, he, along with Ambassador Al Uteba in Washington from the United Arab Emirates, played a huge role in developing and creating the Abraham Accords. And I encourage everyone in the room to just go online, 
go to Google and search for Bahrain, United Emirates, Israel, and see the multiple encounters and issues that are percolating and often don't receive a lot of, a lot of attention. I want to add on one of your regional, regional points. Um, many of us, or all of us in the room, will recall what happened when one ship was stuck in the Suez Canal. The Red Sea is one of the most complicated and important trade routes on the planet. It has great power, friction between, you have Russia, China, the United States present, but we also have uh, new arrangements developing, such as the Western Quad, as it's known, Israel, India, the United States, and the United Arab Emirates, keeping the Red Sea, which is threatened in the south by the Houthis, and uh, by a variety of actors along the way, um, uh, keeping that safe, frankly, is critical to the economies of the globe. And Israel plays a huge part in this. And I want to commend you for your country's leadership in this regard and your work with, with CENTCOM. If I can mention the Houthis for a minute, slide to that issue. Uh, traditionally, uh, Yemen has not been an area of significant focus by Israel. Uh, in the early 70s, there were some Palestinian threats to uh, Israeli shipping, but generally it's not been maybe on the front burner of your security forces. Uh, we now have the Houthis, who have the reprehensible uh, flag, which includes the phrase death to America, death to Israel, and curse the Jews. We have the Houthis now using Iranian missiles and uh, drones, which are, not, which are capable of reaching from Yemen today, Israel as well as many other places in the region. The hundreds of missiles that have been fired by the Houthis against Saudi Arabia and drones uh, don't turn left and right over the heads of Americans, as I tell people. There are tens of thousands of, of citizens from multiple countries who are threatened by these missiles. But now Israel has a new potential threat with the Houthis, who have stood with Hamas, who have talked about firing upon Israel, how do you look at the Red Sea? How do you look at the Houthi threat? How does this, how does this new development impact your security posture? So Iran, uh, in order to project power in the region, uh, relies not only on its own forces and capabilities, but also on proxies. And those proxies have proliferated. So we are surrounded by some of the Iranian proxies in Lebanon, of course, Hezbollah, with uh, numerous uh, rockets and missiles uh, of around 200,000 projectiles, including mortars and so on, uh, proxies in Syria, in Iraq, in Gaza, and in Yemen, part of an Iranian attempt to encircle Israel and to project power uh, in the region. And these proxies are now armed with strategic weapons, with, with rockets and with uh, missiles, and the Iranians are delivering a lot of capabilities uh, to them, and all of us in the region are impacted by them or threatened by them. We are threatened by them, but also those proxies fired at Saudi Arabia, the biggest oil field in the world in 2019. Earlier this year, several um, attacks on the Emirates, uh, the UAE and Dubai, and uh, others in the regions are also impacted by that, which I think all the more underscores the need for regional cooperation to push back uh, against them. We are very mindful of what's happened in Yemen and the Houthis. The Houthis publicly threatened Israel that they will target us. And as you mentioned, they have missiles capable of reaching uh, Israel. And they could, of course, threaten our maritime traffic through the Straits. And we are very careful and mindful about that and uh, have also delivered some uh, deterrent message uh, to them through others. But I think we have to, have to see the general picture. Uh, the Iran uh, sending its arms uh, throughout the region through these uh, proxies. It's uh, something that all of us have to unite against and, and push back against. As I mentioned, it is not covered by any nuclear deal. It is up to us. We are making the point of the U.S. administration that even if, if you sign a nuclear deal, and it, since it doesn't cover what Iran does in the region, and it, it might even destabilize the region because it will afford Iran hundreds of billions of dollars, and some of this money will find its way to others and will all be impacted by it. This requires 
a, a strategy that coordinated between the US and its willing partners in the region. We are doing our part in Syria. We'd like others to join in that and push back against Iran. I think that's very wise, and I have always advocated that the best Iran policy should be bipartisan within the United States and should be undertaken in complete uh, cooperation and concert with the regional uh, countries who both must will first feel the results of any deal or non-deal, but also defend, in addition to their own nationals, the tens, hundreds of thousands of Americans in this region. And I think one takeaway that I've already heard from your conversation is just as the Abraham Accords have, in essence, added a lot of work to your foreign ministry, that Iran's regional um, reach with its militias um, uh, in, in a way that could literally impact the global economy through the Red Sea and the Strait of Hormuz have also added new requirements to um, uh, your military and the cooperation with your partners in the region. Mr. Ambassador, if we could move north for just a moment. Um, the United States and Israel have uh, worked extensively to develop um, uh, 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 or, or to come upon an agreement for a maritime border uh, between Israel and Lebanon and also to develop a, um, a joint use of a gas field. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of this, the Eastern Mediterranean is a rich source of natural gas. And uh, this gas, if, if exploited appropriately, would provide the poor Lebanese people who are suffering from such dire revenue shortages with the ability to pay for electricity and to pick up garbage. And the Lebanese um, uh, political institutions have made these negotiations difficult, in, in large part because of Lebanese Hezbollah. This gas would also be of great use to, um, to Israel's economy, to Egypt's economy, and obviously of great importance to Europe, particularly in these days. So, Ambassador, could you give us uh, your perspective as to where this issue stands and uh, tell us why you believe this is so important? So we're actually in advanced stages of uh, negotiations on the maritime border between Israel and Lebanon. Of course, the gas fields that are beneath and sometimes cross that border to both sides. Uh, it's a very delicate, uh, these are very delicate negotiations. In fact, we've been taking the time while here in New York to also negotiate this week. Uh, we have the US med mediator, uh, Mr. Hochstein here. The Lebanese prime minister is, is in town. We don't meet with him, but we do negotiate through the Americans. I believe we're quite close, but not, here, not there yet, and I'm not sure there will be a deal. I think that it's obvious why it is in our interest. Yeah, I think it will benefit uh, not only our economy, it also benefits stability in the region. It should be in Lebanon's interest, because Lebanon is a failing state, Lebanon is melting down, they, uh, they're totally collapsing, they, they have maybe two hours of electricity a day, they cannot collect their garbage. Poverty level, levels in Lebanon is way beyond 50%, some say 75%. This is really a failing state, and it should be first and foremost in their interest to reach a deal. However, unfortunately, in the reality of Lebanon, Hezbollah holds a veto power over this decision. As, and as we all know, Hezbollah serves not only a Lebanese agenda, but also an Iranian agenda. I'm not sure that Hezbollah will ultimately give the green light. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, and we are facing a situation where while we are negotiating, uh, Hezbollah's leader, Nasrallah, every other day issues warnings against us and threats that if we don't go their way and give them what they want in the negotiations, that they will use force against the oil rig that's out there in uh, an Israeli-controlled gas field, Karish, which is, by the way, in undisputed territory. It's, it's our right to extract gas from that field. And he's saying, if you do not give us what we want in negotiations, we will deny you the ability to extract gas in that field and other fields as well. We reject that out of hand. We will not negotiate under threats and other ultimatums. When we are ready, technically, we'll extract gas, extract gas from that field, which, as I said, is an undisputed territory. If they want a deal, they have it. But if he wants to play with fire, I think he will be burned more than anybody else. And again, this has a 
such a human tragedy for the Lebanese people who have approximately one or two weeks worth of wheat in the entire country because of their lack of foreign reserves uh, and have such terrible living conditions because of, uh, as you say, a failing state uh, marked by corruption and by uh, the influence of Lebanese Hezbollah. So the human factor of Iran's proxies is, I, again, I'm not sure it's always seen as, as starkly as it is in, in Lebanon, and I wish these negotiations success. Yeah, I would just mention here, we, we all have to be mindful of the fact that wherever Iran is dominant, that area is dying. Look at Lebanon, it is totally a failing state because Hezbollah took over and it controls the national agenda and it serves an Iranian agenda and not a Lebanese agenda. Look at Iran being unable to form a government. Look at the political crisis there. Iraq has tremendous potential, but because Iran dominates it, see where it goes. And look at Iran itself, what's happening there, the violation of human rights, the, uh, the unrest in Iran. We've just seen this case of this uh, young lady, 22 years old, who was arrested because she did not properly put the hijab on, and she found her death, probably beaten to death by uh, the Iranian morality police. So uh, every, everywhere they touch, uh, it's, it's like a death touch. It is a true axis of misery, have some, of, some have called it. Ambassador, I'd like to continue in your, in your near abroad, if I may, and talk about Syria. Iran has worked extensively to sustain the Bashar al-Assad regime, worked with Moscow. Uh, Iran s sent the Quds Force in, in force, in 2013, 2014. Iran has lost many generals. I think Israel has prevented successfully Iran from establishing a missile base, a multilateral um, um, of, of, of force on Israel's border, even a naval base. But in fairness, according to press reports, Israel is compelled to conduct multiple airstrikes to prevent Iran from delivering precision-guided munitions, both for use in Syria and for passage to Lebanese Hezbollah. And Iran uses munitions with its proxies, wherever they are, to include the Houthis, only its civilian targets. And this is an important, important um, a characteristic. The Houthi weapons um, have almost exclusively, with very few exceptions, been aimed at uh, high-density civilian areas, economic targets such as energy, et cetera, et cetera. Ambassador, you, your country defends not only your own citizens, but hundreds of thousands of, of non-Israelis who either make Israel their home or come for tourism. How is it that a fight that is against the international community is your country's responsibility alone? How is it that Israel is in a, a version of a forever war, that to defend citizens from many countries against what is Quds Force efforts to frankly, shoot missiles and drones at them. Can you give us a sense of your perspective on this conflict and uh, why you believe the international community doesn't play a larger role in compelling Iran to leave Syria with uh, the Quds Force? Well, you're absolutely right uh, in your question. We are at the far front of pushing back against Iran in our neighborhood. We can't cover the whole Middle East, so we focus on our immediate neighborhood in Syria, in Lebanon, in Gaza, and elsewhere. Uh, we have been targeting Iranian military targets for over a decade now in Syria, but we launched a campaign in early 2017, and that uh, we did after uh, it became clear to us that there is an Iranian strategic plan designed by Qasem Soleimani, Allah Yerachamu, as we say, uh, to turn Syria into a formidable military front facing Israel, very similar to what they did in Lebanon, where they armed Hezbollah to their teeth with strategic weapons. They wanted to do the same in Syria and create a long, protracted uh, military front facing Israel, including tens of thousands of uh, rockets and missiles, including an army of proxies mostly Shiite legions. Uh, Qasem Soleimani was thinking about 100,000 warriors there, including Iranian planes and drones. They even wanted to control a war for even a port in Syria. 
And we launched a campaign in order to thwart that. And by and large, we succeeded. The, 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 where they are today is nowhere compared to their planning, where they wanted to be. And I think that proves that if you are strong and determined, you can push back against them, you can deter them. The fact that we've been striking so many times and did not escalate to war with Iran is because we deter them. You can deter them, but in order to deter them, you have to be willing to apply force, to push back. Because if you not do that, they will push back against you and, and as I said, push the envelope to the extent possible. Unfortunately, in the international community, not everybody is interested. They have other things on their agenda, uh, either internationally or domestically. And it's convenient for many people <clears throat> to leave it to us uh, to do that job in Syria. I would like to see more regional partners partnering with us to push back against Syria. Some of our partners are encouraging us to continue and do so, but they themselves do not feel strong enough to face Iran frontally. And they prefer that we'll do that dirty job but that's why I think the cooperation under the umbrella of CENTCOM is critical because that provides an umbrella that allows them as well to do certain things. We can share intelligence, we can share operational thinking, we can help each other, we can do a lot of things. And I think we are more effective if we do it together than separately. I think that's uh, uh, quite, quite true. Uh, I've had the honor and the privilege of working with Israeli security personnel over the years, and there is uh, literally nothing I think we can't do if we partner together. Ambassador, we have a few more minutes left. I'd like to ask you uh, one more question about your neighbors, Turkey. Your relations with Turkey have been mixed over the years, uh, just put it gently. Where is it? Where is it going right now? And how do you see um, uh, this relationship going forward in terms of your economic engagement, your political engagement, and your differing views on the region? So our relations with Turkey are, how should I say it, complicated, and uh, we're very we're moving ahead, but very carefully. As you know, since 2010, we had the crisis, then the Mavi Marmara, and so on with Turkey. Uh, but we are now in a better place. They reached out to us. Uh, our president visited Turkey a while ago. Yesterday there was a meeting between Erdogan and our prime minister here in New York. Uh, our biggest concern was their active support to Islamist movements, first and foremost Hamas, and the fact that uh, contrary to an agreement with Israel, uh, Hamas activists were given free hand or were allowed to instigate terror attacks against that from Turkish soil. And this is something that we raise with the Turks as a first point if you want to move ahead. And I don't want to go into too ma many details, but we are in an improved uh, state today than was the case before they reached out to us. We're also concerned about some of their activities in the uh, energy field in the East Mediterranean. Uh, we have very strong cooperation with Greece and Cyprus and some European countries. Actually, we're going to start exporting gas to uh, Europe uh, through Egypt, hopefully next year. Uh, so some of their activities in this field were of concern to us. At the same time, I think there is a genuine desire there to improve relations. When we recently had an attempt, actual attempt by the Iranian intelligence to kidnap or kill Israelis in Istanbul, there were at least six Iranian cells in, in town. The Turkish intelligence uh, helped, cooperated, and arrested quite a few of them, and they were very helpful and played a very positive role. So it's a mixed bag, and we're moving very carefully, and we test them by deeds, not only by words. And uh, I hope that these two will actually contribute to regional stability. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, I want to personally thank Senator uh, Lieberman and uh, Ambassador Mark Wallace for their leadership making today work, and thank you for your time and your service to international peace. God bless you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And thank Ambassador Lieb uh, Senator Lieberman and Yuani for everything that you are doing. Thank you.